with a small probability, I can in the next round of my in the next round of my web surfing, I can end up in arbitrary web page. What's the probability to end up at this web page? Well, probability, so this will be our matrix G3, and it will look exactly like this. <coughs> we will have 1 over n for dangling web pages, right? And then probability to end up here, if there was 0 before, right? Probability to end up here will be probability to randomly jump here. Probability to jump at all will be 1 minus alpha. Alpha is this point 85, right? So probability to jump is 1 minus alpha, but I jump to a arbitrary other web page, so I have to prorate it, so here it will be alpha divided by n. Right? Because sorry, 1 minus alpha. Alpha is the probability to continue following links. So it's 1 minus alpha divided by n, 1 minus alpha divided by n. Except when I hit here, here probability to follow the link is alpha divided by the number of outgoing links. Plus, you see, now for this web page, there are two ways to get here. First way is to follow the link. You follow the link with probability alpha, and there are this many outgoing links, so probability to pick the right link to end up here will be alpha divided by this number. But I can also jump randomly there, and probability is 1 minus alpha divided by n, and so forth. Okay. Notice, <coughs> if I apply the same rule to a dangling web page, I will get alpha divided by n plus 1 minus alpha divided by n. This is just 1 over n. So this operation will not alter the dangling website, dangling nodes, only <coughs> the nodes that uh, uh, page bi points at. Okay, and lo and behold, you don't have to do anything else. It turns out that this matrix G3 is guaranteed to satisfy property that rho t is equal to rho t times G3, and lo and behold, there is only one rho that satisfies this equation, and this row is the page rank, right? So notice the, the beautiful part of this. So the original idea doesn't quite work. So you have to tweak the matrix. But the matrix is tweaked in a fully intuitively, heuristically justifiable manner. Just the surfer uh, gets bored and picks instead of following links to make random jumps, and, and dangling nodes, he chooses 1 over n. Okay. Now, that's all nice. This number always exists. But how do we find it? Do we really solve a gigantic system of linear equations, that would be a tragedy, right? Notice there is a big difference between this matrix and starting matrix. How is the starting matrix computationally much friendlier than this matrix? Hmm? That's what's in zero, isn't it? Exactly. This one is called sparse matrix because a tiny, tiny fraction of the matrix contains entries that are non-zero, right? Just each web page might have the, the, this many nodes. So every row has a, a ridiculously small number of non-zero entries, given how huge the row 
is. So somehow, uh, and this is a full matrix, no zeros here whatsoever. So in the first case, when this was G1, this computation is piece of cake because there are very few entries here to use in multiplication. But uh, this is now a full matrix. And uh, it would be a tragedy if uh, we really needed to multiply all entries in a row with all entries in G uh, just to find the product, let alone to find uh, the solution to this equation. But uh, lo and behold, because the matrix, matrix G3 is obtained by a very kind of uh, canonical, very simple way from G, um, G1, uh, the computation of the product can be done very efficiently. So let's look at that. So we have three matrices. Uh, we have matrix G1, right? Then we had a matrix G2 that is equal to matrix G1 plus a matrix that looks like this is 1 over n, and then D times uh, E transposed, where uh, what is now D? D is a sparse vector that has, uh, so D i is equal to 1 if and only if uh, uh, p i is dangling, uh, else uh, d um, i is equal to 0, right? So this is just an indicator which, uh, which page uh, p i is a dangling web page, web page without any. What is E? Uh, actually, this is D transpose because this is a row. Uh, e transpose is just vector of ones. Now, what do I get if I multiply D times E? What will be the size of this matrix? Well, let's see. Uh, whenever you have products, you see every vector is a matrix of size n times 1, right? So this guy has height uh, n and width 1. Uh, e transpose has uh, width 1 and height n, so then uh, d times e transpose is of size, uh, what is the size of d times e transpose? And by n. And lo and behold, when you multiply these two vectors, you will have once precisely where uh, the dangling nodes are, right? And if you divide this by 1 over n, then uh, you will precisely add 1 over n, precisely at entries that uh, are the dangling nodes. Okay, so that's our matrix uh, G2. Now, we have to see uh, what uh, matrix uh, um, G3 looks like. So, G3 is a linear combination of uh, so G, the matrix G3 
is equal to matrix G2 plus, right, plus V add, we multiply the original matrix by alpha and add the corresponding matrix with 1 minus n. So this will be, uh, it will be, sorry, it will be alpha times G2, right? This will produce alphas on every non-zero entry. And everywhere you be at 1 minus alpha divided by n, so it will be 1 minus alpha e times e transpose. Because what is this? What is e times e transpose? All ones here, all ones here. When you find the matrix product, this is an n by n matrix consisting of ones, so this divided by n. Right? Because uh, that's precisely, we add everywhere 1 minus alpha divided by n. So to put it then, replace G2 with the original definition, we see that G3 is equal alpha times G1 plus 1 over n D times E transpose, right? plus uh, 1 minus alpha divided by n, and then E times E transpose. Now, this guy is sparse, right? So a multiplying a vector by this guy will be a piece of cake, so we can keep it <coughs> as is, so we can have this alpha times G1 plus, now this is alpha over N D times E transpose plus 1 minus alpha over N E, e transpose. Now notice E transpose appears on the right on both places, so we can pull it out, and we get that G3 is equal alpha times G1 plus, and then what do I get? I get alpha over N times D uh, plus 1 minus alpha divided by n times e, um, and then the whole thing times e transpose, right? Now, as it turns out, this is particularly uh, simple to compute, to use in a computation, because then rho times matrix G3 <coughs> will be alpha times rho times G1, and this is piece of cake to compute because G1 is sparse, right? Plus, here I'll have alpha <coughs> over n uh, d times, uh, rho times d, plus uh, 1 minus alpha over n rho times E, and then the whole thing E transpose. But what is rho times E? If a rho is a vector of probabilities, they sum up to 1, right? So if rho is a vector of probabilities, What is equal to rho times t? Uh, yes. Sorry, I have to transpose everywhere. Sorry about that. 
So row transpose. What is a row transpose times e? So this is a row times all ones. So what what is the product? One, right? Because uh, these are all ones, right? You have a row times all ones. So when you multiply this row by this column, you will have just sum of all of these. So the row times e is just one. So we get that uh, row transpose times g3 is equal to alpha times rho transpose g1 uh, plus alpha over n um, uh, rho transpose times d uh, plus 1 minus alpha divided by n times e transpose. So uh, this is now very, what is row transpose times d? d are just the dangling web pages. So this is also sparse. Presumably most of the web pages on internet uh, do not have, uh, uh, do have outgoing lists. But regardless, this is just product. This is linear time to compute. It's, uh, most of the entries in d are zero. On the dangling web pages, it will just pick up all the ranks of all dangling web pages. And so this will be just a single number, right? And the single number multiplies a vector that is all ones. So adding it to this can be done very efficiently. So even though G3 is not sparse, it is actually easy to uh, use, to multiply it with a vector of probabilities, right? By the way, you have yeah, beautifully written notes with all of this stuff in, on the uh, web page. And uh, um, okay, now why is it then the case? We uh, have to investigate. Why is it the case uh, that um, that this matrix? produces a unique page rank. So what, intuitively speaking, we kind of slightly tweaked the structure of internet, right? Uh, in what way? Well, if you have a dangling node, we added, you can think of that we added a huge number of outgoing links from the dangling node to absolutely every single web page. So uh, the probability to make a transition here will be very small. It will be one minus alpha, I'm sorry, it will be one divided by n, right? And similarly for every other node, also nodes that do have outgoing links, they also get very weak links, right? Very improbable links to take of, uh, so this now will become alpha over, um, this will become alpha divided by number of outgoing links of P1, and this will be one minus alpha divided by N. So we kind of slightly, uh, we made our graph complete, right? Yes? Do you have to add 1 minus alpha on n to the previous links? Uh, oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, well, this you can imagine that we put up yet another link with my 1 minus alpha divided by n. <coughs> okay. 
So why would this guarantee that there is a unique um, unique uh, page rank satisfying precisely the property that rho transposed times g will give you back rho t. This is essentially having this hold true, right? So this holds true except that uh, now instead of this all web pages uh, p will point to so p uh, px all web pages point to p except that this is slightly mutilated it's multiplied by alpha and it's added uh, 1 minus alpha divided by uh, n but uh, the, the role of rho remains exactly the same and our claim is this system of slightly altered equations always has a solution and it has only one solution right why this why is this so well it turns out that <coughs> this is a consequence of an extremely important theorem whenever we deal with random things namely that uh, every Markov <coughs> chain that is uh, uh, a periodic and uh, irreducible has a unique stationary distribution so now Markov chains are incredibly important in computer science and in finance, right, Ryan told me he had an um, internship with Commonwealth Bank and they were using, he was working there with Markov chains. Markov chains are also used in speech recognition. Uh, they are also uh, used uh, just in gazillions of uh, other uh, applications. So, how many of you have heard of Markov chains? Uh, okay, so half, half. Okay, so I'll give you a very short introduction into what Markov chains are. And my favorite example of a Markov chain is the mood of my wife. <laughs> okay. At any moment in time. Must I turn off the recording? No, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid everyone on campus has heard of my wife. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so at any moment in time, my wife can be uh, happy. Happens occasionally. <laughs> and, uh, she can be very happy. She can be indifferent. And then she can be angry and very, very angry, okay? Now, over all the years that I've been married, I tried to find uh, uh, the, uh, the regularity of the changes of mood of my wife. But at the end, I had to accept that they were uh, governed by a random process, right? <laughs> so if my wife is in happy mood at that moment, in this moment. Uh, next moment, uh, she can be uh, angry, for example. Uh, she can stay happy. Uh, she can be very angry. And uh, say she can be indifferent. Now, what I noticed is, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of history made her happy, the probability that she will get angry or very angry doesn't depend at all on what I do, right? It only is a random process that if she is happy, then with the probability uh, 0.9, next moment she will get angry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, so, the, so what is a Markov chain? 
Markov chain is characterized by a, state, a set of states. In this example, this would be the moods of my wife. And it is characterized by a probability matrix that tells you at the time for discrete Markov chains uh, is discrete, which means it goes in increments by one. So if uh, the state uh, uh, of, uh, say, state is equal to Si, uh, then you have probability to transition from S to Si for all other possible states, including that very state. Okay. <coughs> um, what, how would, for example, <coughs> this be um, related to speech recognition? Well, just to start, you see, you can think of what my speaking as producing distinct phonemes, right? And uh, uh, probability that after a phoneme A will come another phoneme B depends on that original phoneme, right? <coughs> so, <coughs> or better even if we think about our random surfer, the state will be at what web page he is. Probabilities of transitioning to, to go to any other web pages are given by our matrix. Right? So in general, you have a, state, a, set, a set of states and the probabilities P, I, <coughs> J that are such that if I am in state I, probability to go into state J is given in the table. And sum of each row is equal to 1, because for, from any state, I have to go to one of the available states. So sum of all entries on the, each row will be equal to 1. Matrices that have this property are called raw stochastic matrices. <coughs> so what is now, um, and in fact, after we finish uh, page rank, we will do uh, another extremely important application of uh, Markov chains, namely something called Viterbi decoder, which, well, at least it used to be the main engine in speech recognition software until uh, the emergence of uh, neural nets, because nowadays uh, we just don't bother to do anything ourselves. You just feed the raw data to deep learning neural net, and you expect to come up with uh, great solutions. And in fact, it does seem that it works, and no one has a clue why it works. <laughs> <laughs> to total annoyance of people who like to know the causes uh, and the facts, right? But uh, such is uh, life. It usually doesn't conform to our ideas. OK. <coughs> so. Uh, a run of a Markov chain is then a simply sequence of states, S1, uh, well, let's call it uh, state uh, S of 1, S at point 2, state at point i, and each S of i, I mean, uh, each uh, belongs to a fixed set of uh, uh, states, right? Um, so now you can see that 
our random surfer, the question, right, so the states are the web pages. The probabilities of transitioning are precisely the probabilities given <coughs> by our matrix, right? And we can now ask exactly the question that we asked about our random surfer. If you make a very, very long run, say, of t many clicks, what is the probability distribution for the last state, right? And what we wanted is no matter from which state we started, for as long as t is very large, probability for this to be a particular symbol, a particular state, say, sigma k, right, will almost not depend on t in the sense that uh, the probability distribution over all possible states for your Markov chain to be in after t many uh, transitions <coughs> will be, will converge, right? Um, essentially what this means is that under certain conditions on the Markov chain, after a sufficient run, Markov chain tends to settle in a fixed probability distribution over states. And this is the cardinal theorem about Markov chains that says uh, if a Markov chain is uh, uh, irreducible and a periodic, then it has exactly one uh, stationary distribution uh, rho i a distribution so that uh, so when you apply on that vector your matrix of transitions you will get back the, the very same vector what does it mean the probability to be in a particular state will stabilize when n and a raw transpose is the limit. Uh, so raw transpose, uh, well, let's write it like this. And raw i of this stationary distribution is the limit of how many times um, of times uh, the chain uh, was in state uh, row i over total number of let's call it surfing of transitions uh, right so if you uh, let a uh, and I'll explain in a moment what irreducible and a periodic means uh, but it means but when it has when a Markov chain has these nice two properties then if you let it run for a very long time, probability of distribution for the last value, which state it is, 
will be in, almost independent of t because it will converge to fixed numbers as t goes to infinity. Yes? Uh, is there a requirement for t? Does it have to be sufficient large or is it Well, out? yes, uh, automatically because if t, well, this is, we have a limit. So t, if t is, uh, so when t goes to infinity, right? So this means that, uh, say, for every epsilon, there is a t0 so that if the run is longer than t0, uh, probability that at instant t that you are in sigma k will be and equal to the probability to be in another t larger also than t0, the difference will be smaller than epsilon, right? So, um, that's in fact uh, the case, and lo and behold, uh, and uh, rho is equal to the limit, uh, rho is equal to the limit when n goes to infinity, uh, uh, rho zero times uh, matrix G to the power N, where uh, rho zero is uh, arbitrary. So no matter from what state you start, right? So if you start, say, you pick initial state with probability 1 over n, any state. So you pick any internet page to start with. What is the next, let's see, what is the probability distribution after one transition? Let's look at that. So you start with, uh, so these are all of your states. Uh, in our case, these are all web pages on the internet. And say you pick them, any of them with probability 1 over n. Right? So this is t is equal to 0. When t is equal to 1. What is the probability to be in this state? Well, that probability is probability to be in this state times the probability uh, of transitioning from one back to 